Hi, Niti. Hi, Erica. Hi. Oh, I was just checking my sound. Can you hear me? Okay? Can you also hear us? Perfect. We'll wait for one more minute just to... And then we'll start. To the multi-stakeholder model. Um, so in this session we want to talk uh, about the uh, EU ban on RT and Sputnik by the European Commission. We have a great panel to discuss this uh, this topic uh, and but, it, but the aim of that town hall is really to have a have a broader debate about this important issue. Um, um, I will introduce all panelists to you but before we start let's have a quick recap on what the issue actually is. Um, so after Russia invaded Ukraine uh, in, uh, in February uh, this year, uh, the EU decided on the 2nd of March to prohibit the broad broadcasting of two Russian media outlets, uh, R2, formerly known as Russia Today, and Sputnik. Interestingly enough, this was not only for the television broadcasting of these stations, but also for the websites and channels that uh, would stream content from these websites. So other websites that would, would, would stream directly from those websites. The prohibition to broadcast was proposed uh, through a restrictive measure that was taken by the EU against uh, Russia in regard to the, ra uh, to the war. Uh, to not to abide this uh, measure in the Netherlands would be a criminal offence. Um, in the Netherlands, uh, six websites were mentioned by the AMC, which is the Dutch Authority for Consumers and Markets. Um, and it, it basically said to ISPs in the Netherlands that these six websites should be banned uh, and shouldn't be provided to the consumers who are requesting the website, right? Um, and this is an this could be a hint, at least that that's basically what 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 we're going to discuss about. This could be a hint on new area on internet governance, in which governmental body uh, bodies impose policy re and regulations top down, thereby bypassing the consensus driven and bottom up model that we always have regarded as the stakeholder model for internet governance. And the questions that we wanted to that 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 that, that were in Netherlands were very much al were alive. So, what what is the appropriate scope for those sanctions? To what extent should governing bodies be able to impose these sanctions? And should governing bodies be able to require internet service providers to block certain websites? And to an inter to answer those questions, uh, two Dutch organisations, the MSX and ECP, which is the Dutch platform for internet for information society, brought together a public private partners to discuss in a neutral and well closed settings uh, to create an argument map that you all have received. If you don't have one, they're more up here in the front. 
to discuss the arguments for and against this block, this, uh, this, uh, this internet blockade. And uh, the, regarding the, the question that started this discussion is the question that's in the middle, that is, what are the arguments in the Netherlands for and against the EU regulation requiring internet service providers to block the websites of RT and Sputnik News? So 30 experts from different organizations, government, private sector, NGOs, have discussed the, that question and they came up with several arguments that are presented here on this map. And today we're going to run through them, but also see how they echo in a more international um, surrounding, or if they, could, if they could be coupled to a broader international discussion. So, um, let me start by introducing the, the, the panelists. We've got uh, two panelists online and two panelists here in the room. We've got uh, Niti Biani from the International Society. She's here online. We have Bastian Goslings from RIPE NCC. We have Mieke van Heesewijk from the SIDN Foundation. And we have got Erika Moret from the Graduate Institute of Geneva. Um, with whom she, I, will, I, will, I will just run uh, the list by, by as I presented them. So maybe I can could you first ask Niti to, Biani to introduce herself a bit and also to have her reflections on the argument map as it has been presented um, today. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I've already been introduced, but I'll uh, I'll just say this about the Internet Society. Um, so I, I am Neeti, I'm based out in New Delhi in India, and uh, I work with the Internet Society, which is a global not-for-profit organization uh, that works for an open, globally connected, secure, and trustworthy internet. Um, so, you know, just a few reflections based off of the argument map that's been shared with everyone here. Um, the argument map is basically based on, uh, you know, the blocking of RT and Sputnik News. Uh, but what's more important also to remember that, you know, because of the tumultuous year that we've had, uh, you know, with with Ukraine and Russia uh, and, and the Ukrainian crisis, the, the requests to, you know, block or sanction uh, didn't just stop at the content layer, which is, you know, what we see with these news websites. In fact, in February, Ukraine officials even asked ICANN to shut down root servers in Russia. They asked RIPE NCC to revoke the rights of Russian members to IPv4 and IPv6 addresses. And then, you know, in March, subsequently, we saw two companies, two internet infrastructure companies called Cogent and Lumen shutting down uh, Russian networks from the internet. And, you know, the, these, these actions have several different, uh, several different motivations. So, you know, the, the request that Ukraine had made was a geopolitical request, hoping to, you know, as we say, shut down the Russian internet, whereas Cogent and Lumen, their actions were more motivated, you know, to pick a side as many businesses, organizations, individuals and governments have to do in in you know such a such a conflict ridden state of affairs and uh, cogent and lumen therefore thought that their businesses would do better if they were to completely withdraw from from russia um you know at the internet society we're of the position that the internet is a great great shared resource it's a, it's a force for good for everyone and you know it's it's a resource that belongs to nobody and at the same time it belongs to everybody so you know we're of the position that internet sanctions and similarly politically motivated decisions that impact the open global internet fundamentally undermines everything that the internet needs to exist and all of those conditions that the internet needs to thrive. And at the same time, political sanctions, pol politically motivated decisions go against the multi-stakeholder model of internet governance. Um, you know, these proposals and actions that we've seen, they result uh, not only in sanctioning, you know, what we know as a nation state. It is after all a social construct, right? A nation state. But what happens is that these proposals and actions result in disconnecting users and therefore threaten this open public, you know, very, very crucial resource that we have for everyone. Um, and ultimately, if these actions do go through, thankfully, you know, uh, world leaders have been resisting these calls, the, the internet community uh, in totality have has been resisting these calls. But ultimately, if these actions were to go through, uh, you know, network operations would be disrupted far beyond 
a certain country's borders, they would have unintended consequences that would undermine the use of the internet by people in Russia. Um, you know, it would it would most and most importantly, I think, fragment the internet along geographical, political, commercial, and technical boundaries. And you know, everyone who's in the internet uh, community or is part of the technical community or even just uses the internet knows that the reason it is so seamless is because that there are no boundaries in the internet or on the internet. And, and also, as a result of these actions, we don't want to go about setting a dangerous precedent that would undermine trust in the multi-stakeholder governance process. So I'm just going to pause here. Uh, these were like a few initial thoughts, but over to you. Thank you, uh, Niti, for these, uh, for these reflections. Um, I introduce you to, to, to the two speakers here and, just, and also the, the, the organizations that they are working for, but I do want to mention that they are speaking on their personal capacity and not per se representing, as I understood it, the organizations that they are, they are working with as well. So let, us be, let me move here to, to, to in room here uh, next to me is Bastian Goslings. Um, well, the same question to you. Which was, uh, if you could maybe introduce yourself, but also to have a, a first reflection on the argument map and, and, and sure. your vision. No, thank you. No, no, thank you. Because, you know, I, I, great, uh, uh, some inter very interesting reflections from the Internet Society, but not directly related to the, uh, the, the map as such. Um, I'm Bastian Goslings. I'm Dutch. Uh, I live in the Netherlands. I work for the RIPE NCC, the Regional Internet Registry for the region Europe, uh, Middle East, Central Asia, and former uh, Soviet republics. So actually, what we are discussing here is also something that takes place within uh, in, within our service region. So from that perspective, there is an interest. Um, I took part in one of the sessions, you know, that led to this argument uh, uh, map, which was very interesting. But I will be speaking now on my personal behalf, uh, unless you know maybe at a later stage, if we also like want to feel we want to discuss uh, elements like what the Euro Ukrainian government called the RIPCC uh, to do in terms of uh, uh, deregistering uh, resources from uh, Russian networks. But with regard to the uh, argument map, um, I, I, I feel that there are like basically two angles you can look at this uh, from. Initially, the, the order the order itself, how, how it came about and what the underlying rationale uh, of it is. Um, from my, what I've learned, it actually it, it happened over a weekend. It went really, really fast. So um, unanimously, the member states of the European Union decided that, that this was necessary and had to be implemented. Um, the parliament was only informed, ex post. Um, they were not part of this. So uh, some argue that, that you know, um, you can, you can question the actual legitimacy of this uh, 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 order. And also in terms of the propor proportionality of it, um, the, the European orders, they, they specifically refer, refer that to the fact that this uh, order is in, in, in line, I think they, they use the term consistent, uh, with the European Convention on Human Rights, and they refer to freedom of expression, freedom of information, stuff like that. So it's not conflicting as such with those fundamental uh, rights. And on the other hand, and I'm, I'm, I'm totally aware of the fact that human rights as such are not absolute, right? There's always a balancing that has to take place. And the European Union in this case also refers to the fact, um, to the public order aspect of it and security potentially of um, European citizens being uh, affected. So that would then be a reason, and the way I read it, to emphasize that and that being more important than maybe the aspect of uh, freedom of expression and information being limited here. I s personally feel that that is not substan substantiated sufficiently, that argument. So I, I do think that people who are opposing this have a point th there. And as a, a bit of context, in the Netherlands, uh, shortly after um, these orders uh, were published, um, a number of ISPs, uh, uh, journalists, and also some NGOs, you know, that decided to take this to the European court related to you know the the, the aspects I just uh, mentioned you know with, with regard to the legit, legitimacy of this proposal and the proportionality uh, of it and then the other hand I, I said there are two angles uh, I won't go into too much detail with regard to the second but then with regard to the implementation side of it like the order itself is quite generic and who's already referred to the Dutch regulatory authority that listed these websites but it is at least for Dutch ISPs quite unclear what exactly are they meant to do what are these uh, websites, that's just an assessment of the regulatory authority. The regulatory authority is not mandating ISPs to do so. 
Um, I think most of the ISPs are blocking it via the DNS, which in itself is not very effective. If you want, if you want to circumvent that, right, you use a Tor browser, or even more easy, you change your DNS settings. Um, so, also for the ISPs, the order itself is unclear. How long are they meant to comply with? Besides the fact how you comply, but how long are you actually meant to comply with this? Yeah, until the war ends, I think. Is, is that? <laughs> um, so there are a number of pr practical questions as well, you know, that uh, I, I think are quite uh, concerning here. But uh, I will leave it at, uh, at this for my introduction. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Bastian, for your words. Um, and and it, it's very nice that you have these these well these two angles. And I do think that indeed, besides the the political argument or the political view on, on, on the legitimacy of the of such a blockade is of course the implementation issues are very very true. Regarding the end of the uh, blockade, I think that the European Commission said that that there are two conditions for the blockade to stop, which is one to stop uh, the, the, the uh, after Russia has stopped its invasion of Ukraine, and when RT and Sputnik will have stopped pro uh, Russian propaganda and disinformation. So that's a, it's a very very challenging. Um, and MBQ um, um, end phase of this of this ban. Um, let us move now back to online. Uh, we have a, a, a second speaker online, uh, which is uh, Erika Moret from the Graduate Institute of Geneva. Um, I, I basically want to send, uh, say, say, ask you the same question. If you could please quickly introduce yourself, but also have your reflections on the uh, blockade of RT out of your own uh, expertise. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, my name is Erica Moray. I am based in Switzerland. I've uh, been working on sanctions for almost 20 years, and that means I work across the whole range of both multilateral and autonomous sanctions regimes, tackling a whole range of um, objectives. And so what I'll try and do today is draw from some of that wider reflections from the sanctions world as well, if you'll permit me. Um, and first of all, I would like to congratulate you on the work that you've been doing here. I, I found the argument map a really um, comprehensive and very useful tool um, for which to base this type of discussion. And I wish I would see uh, similar things elsewhere when we're looking at sanctions in other areas. So I think it's it's fantastic that you're um, you're having this discussion today and using this map. Um, so I would like to, first of all, take a step back and say that a lot of these debates that you're referring to today and that are actually outlined in the um, in the map, in the argument map, are ones that we are seeing elsewhere in relation to other sanctions regimes. And what we're seeing, of course, is this explosion of sanctions um, across uh, various different targets in the world to tackle a growing range of objectives and using new types of sanctions as well. So um, I would say that we can think about these internet sanctions as part of that kind of expansion of um, sanctions, which are becoming a kind of ever popular tool of foreign and security policy. And um, another really important thing to note here is that we're seeing increased use of sanctions outside of the multilateral framework, so outside of the UN Security Council, and we're seeing a growing collaboration between a core set of uh, sanctions actors, that's to say the EU alongside the United States and now the United Kingdom and Canada, with a number of other countries joining in as well. So I think it's really important here that when, when we're thinking about EU sanctions, this is also um, very typically in collaboration with other actors as well, with other close allies. And therefore, we need to be thinking about some of the cumulative impacts as well across the board um, that are happening more widely in geographical terms. Um, some of the, the, the topics that you've highlighted as well, such as overcompliance, difficulty understanding what is uh, required, the risk of protracted sanctions regimes, and this very delicate balance between human rights and other considerations is again really um, topical at the moment across other areas of sanctions as well. So um, I also wanted to just uh, take a step back like Niti and mention um, following Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February, we see a new page, of course, in international relations and diplomacy and global security, but it's also changing the face of debates um, regarding sanctions generally, including against internet service providers. And, and I think we can look back to the call from the government of Ukraine, which was really unprecedented to cut off Russia's access to the internet, um, which if it had been enacted, it could have turned Russia into a digital island, in inverted commas. And that's, of course, at the time when the um, Russia Today and Sputnik uh, restrictions, sanctions came in. Um, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers um, responded uh, to this request, turning it down, highlighting it wasn't within their power to enact such a move. 
And um, Reip also argued that the means to communicate should not be affected by domestic political disputes, international conflicts and war. Um, what we've seen, however, is the, the more nuanced adoption of sanctions against uh, th these um, TV um, stations um, is, is somewhat similar to earlier moves that we've seen elsewhere, including against certain targets in Iran, Syria and Sudan. And another really notable shift here, which you've already highlighted in the argument map, is this mass, mass withdrawal from Russia by an, a range of multinational firms. And this has included technology, internet, social media companies, and so on. Uh, and this takes a number of uh, forms. It can be uh, adherence to sanctions in place. It can be over compliance. It can be linked to financial sector de-risking or wider voluntary boycotts. But cumulatively, this has served to amplify the impacts of the internet restrictions that are in place. Um, <laughs> excuse me. And so this increasingly complex and far reaching san sanctions landscape um, that we've already um, seen explained well in the sanctions map, in, excuse me, in the argument um, chart, presents multiple challenges to private sector companies, as well as NGOs and others, uh, individuals too, that may struggle to understand what activities are allowed and what steps must be um, taken to avoid falling foul of the measures. Um, and I'll just conclude with a few um, reflections here. Um, global sanctions regimes can impact on the internet service providers in a variety of different ways. But the findings that I'm picking up on is that firms in particular are not really equipped with sufficient tools or know-how to navigate these regulations effectively. And I think this is a big problem that we see not just in uh, likely in the Netherlands, but elsewhere in Europe and elsewhere in the world. This risks putting companies in breach of international law or regional national legal frameworks, and it could put them, uh, make them subject to fines and criminal prosecutions. And it, it results in a range of compliance risks. It could be over compliance, it could be under compliance or non compliance. It could also be incorrect application, it could be compliance that's too early. It can link to financial de sector de-risking where banks and other financial institutions step away from um, a certain organizations or, or countries, um, either because of the risk of penalties or because of the bureaucratic burden. Or it could even be customers seeking compensation or suing for damages. And then, of course, we have the, the very pertinent questions that remain on human rights, merits of an open society and then security and privacy concerns. So I'll stop there, but I look forward to engaging in more detail. Thanks. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Erica, for for your reflections. And it's indeed very interesting to 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 place these very concrete sanctions that are well effective in the European Union in this broader scheme of discussions that we saw um, also happening at the same time with the call to to have broader internet sanctions. Um, where I had to think back on this WEF paper from six years ago, from 2016, where they list basically three forms of internet fragmentation, mainly. The, they make a distinction there between the technical fragmentation, which is the sanctions that we that were basically the call that from from Ukraine government to ICANN and RIPE. We've got they they define governmental governmental fragmentation, which is something that I think that we're discussing right now. And then they also discuss commercial fragmentation, which has to do with well, basically with platforms. Um, not to bring something new to the discussion, but just make to 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 reflect on the fact that that that. That we are really looking to to the real implications of those 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 possibilities that were already discussed in that paper six years ago. So maybe a food for thought later in the discussion. Um, let me move back to here in the in the room to to Mika van Heeswijk. Um, the same question to you: if you could introduce yourself, but also have your personal reflections on this argument map. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mika van Heeswijk, and I work as a deputy director of the SIDN fund. But I'm also uh, in the board of commissioners of a big Dutch publishing company. In this regard, this could be interesting. And I used to be in the board of .org as a, a trustee member. So I couldn't agree more with the reflections uh, of Internet Society on this topic. Uh, and a lot of has been said already. And for myself, I'm really on the right side of the argument map. And uh, the discussion today is not about the core of the internet, although it was mentioned uh, a couple of times before. Uh, and I take a, a really democratic point of view. I don't think it's up to uh, the EU Commission to take these uh, uh, sanctions on 
Russia, because uh, why not take sanctions on other countries which are in war? So that's, um, I think that's my main, uh, that's the main argument I, I stand for. And this also makes that people will going to distrust the core of the internet, but, but also distrust the internet uh, as a whole. And that is, uh, I think, a shame and dangerous for a free, open, strong internet. So I leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Mieke. Um, so now we have uh, a little bit of an overview of, of where the different speakers are coming from. Um, well, the idea is basically to discuss in the town hall setting this map, and uh, therefore I'm also turning to you to see if there are any things that I'm, I was able. Was everyone able to to look, take a look at the at the map? I see a lot of people nodding, so that's great. Um, and I think that that for us, or not, well, not for us, for for ECP, um, who, who who wrote the map, not per se for the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, it, it's very interesting to to hear what what the different views are, and I think that there are. There are a few few key questions that we what we're looking at is the, so what what arguments do you think are most valuable and what arguments are are um, how should we weigh these arguments but also are there certain arguments missing in this map and how could we add or contribute or and 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 and, 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 and improve it on it in a more international way? I already saw one finger, um, two fingers. And so three, four. So, so yeah. Um, should we get? Um, well, let, let's just see. Let's start. And then, yeah. Hi, Paul. Um, it's Paul here. I'm just. Uh, there's two two things in the discussion that that hasn't yet come up, that I think is important to keep in mind. The first one is that um, while there has been an effort since um, the invasion of Ukraine from certain quarters, like the Ukrainian government, to isolate Russia's internet from from the global community. The reality is that Russia isolated itself. It isolated its own internet in 2012. There has been blacklisting of IP addresses, domain names. The Russian state does not have a, it already has a fragmented internet. So I think any discussion about what actions uh, cause a fragmentation of the internet that we're having today should not lose sight of a history of countries who have done so, and that very much includes Russia. Russia has very much uh, dictated what its own people are able to access on the internet. The second thing that I think we shouldn't lose sight of is that we're able to have this discussion about the European Union's directions, about what the Dutch government did. We're able to criticize, we're able to critically and academically and however we want to engage. I can say that the Dutch government are total morons and that they have ugly shoes and that the country is terrible and the gentleman from the foreign ministry will smile and laugh and I won't be kicked out of the country. You cannot say that about all societies. So I, I think we need to sort of keep in mind, you know, so I, I very strongly am of the view that the European Union um, has misstepped in some respects as to what their response has been. Uh, with regards to blacklisting RT and, and Sputnik, I think we, we, can, we can look at particular points on the map, but we can have that discussion. We can say that Ukraine was well within its sovereign rights as a country to request assistance in defending itself in, in a war of aggression. But by the same token, the internet community responded accordingly to, to that request. You can say that you had every right to make the request and we didn't accept it. That's not the attitude from certain states and I think we shouldn't ever lose sight of that um, lest we tolerate hypocrisy and, and, and nonsense. Thank you. And, and no, I don't think the Dutch are stupid. <laughs> Great. I just want to ask your last name so I can put you on the blacklist. But <laughs> <laughs> let's move to the to the, to the gentleman in front who also had his uh, uh, hand up. There's a mic coming over. Yeah. That, that. Thank you very much. It was a very interesting uh, issue to be raised here. Actually, I think uh, we are uh, we have been discussing a lot about the the notion of fragmentation and also national sovereignty. Uh, and uh, I couldn't find any uh, good balance between these two, that we are, at the same time we, we are uh, looking for a universal internet and uh, not fragmented internet, but at this, uh, uh, on, on the other side of the page we are uh, dealing with a kind of the uh, national sovereignty concerns. Uh, but uh, what is happening here uh, in the case of the Ukrainian and 
Russian conflict and the, uh, the map, the argument of the map, uh, is that uh, the, the main argument is the dissemination of the misinformation. Yesterday, in the early morning, in this room, we had another session about the, the level of the misinformation. This information has been uh, uh, propagated by, by the Ukrainians. Uh, one of the gentlemen uh, uh, presented the slides with some statistics inside it. And if the rationale behind those kind of the sanctions is the spreading of the misinformation and disinformation, it should be in a, uh, it should be applied in the balanced way between two sides, not only one side. Uh, what is happening now, and in the case of the EU sanctions, is something different from the national sovereignty concerns that some countries, because of their own sovereignty concern, may have some, their own policies. But what is happening now is the politicization or over politicization of the internet that uh, just has been pretexted by the disinformation and misinformation, while at the same time we have another claim that has been presented yesterday just here about the other side of the, the conflict. And it's a kind of the over-politicization that we think about and we should be concerned about. I'm, I'm Sayed from, uh, from a university in Tehran. You know. Thank you very much. Um, Let's have two more, uh, or four, four, three, I see three more hands, four more hands. Uh, that's great. L l l just um, maybe the first of person in the front, and then we can go to the, you can pass it on yourself. The back. Yeah, thank you very much. Could you, could, could, be, could you please introduce yourself before you um, start? I'm Michel Kenno. I'm the advisor for communication and information at UNESCO, office in Dakar. Uh, first of all, I want to commend you for this uh, presentation of the two sides of the argument. Um, uh, when I look into all uh, these discussions on the issues of disinformation, uh, this morning in this very room we have been discussing on the regulation. And I believe that in almost most of the European countries they have law in place, regulatory mechanism to address the issues of disinformation. And disinformation doesn't come only through Sputnik or IT, it comes from different channels and even s social platforms that are also relaying different types of disinformation and even probably social platform are the main relayer of disinformation than even uh, traditional media or even Sputnik of uh, um, uh, RT. So uh, I'm concerned what's the types of message that this is being uh, conveying in terms of addressing the issues of disinformation. Uh, secondly, uh, we all know uh, from academic literature that whenever there is war, there is propaganda from both sides of the war and for all the parties involved in that. How, the, if the European Union is so much concerned with the issues of disinformation, are they actually addressing the disinformation from the different sides? Not only those or the parties that are involved in the conflict, but also the parties that have some interest in seeing either the conflict to continue or the conflict to stop. What are the actions that they are taking to actually address the disinformation that all those entities are actually uh, manufacturing and distributing through our different channels? So it looks like, and finally, uh, 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 Ukrainian war is not the only war ongoing in the world where disinformation is being spread through traditional means, traditional media, and also uh, inter uh, social network and so on. Why the EU is not also in its um, engagement toward addressing the issues of disinformation, also taking action to counter the disinformation related to the wars that are also going on, let's say in Yemen, and we know how this is impacting the life of people out there. So we want to uh, see what is the real message that EU is trying to convey through these types of uh, decision? Thank you. Thank you. That's a great question. Uh, you can w just move the the the, the, um, the microphone to the back. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Mikaela Shapiro. I work for Global Partners Digital. Um, I also wanted to pick up on the point of what the ultimate message is from coming from the European Union. I was thinking about this from the elements, I think it was Erica who mentioned the technical aspects of 
how to enforce these kind of sanctions that even the private sector, the firms that have the most technical know-how are often unable to comply with these due to lack of technical know-how or the tools existing to do that. So I guess to me, the technical element of how to enact and implement these sanctions is an element that I was hoping maybe we could talk a little bit more and hear more about. Because to me, at least from the map, that's the one element that was, at least to me, seemed a little played down, that you can circumvent this relatively easily. And that was something that also came up. I was recently at an IETF session that was all about how to circumvent when governments are blocking certain websites, in this case, ostensibly more likely to be accurate information, but you can see it from both sides, that there is technology to circumvent these blockades. So what is the ultimate aim if you can circumvent it easily? If it's purely symbolic, then that might be the better way to present it. Thank you. I'll hop in here as well. Uh, my name is Kian Vjastensen. I work for Freedom House. Um, many compliments on, on this map. Um, it's very useful and I suppose my only complaint is that my uh, team and I spent many hours deliberating and didn't come up with anything quite so clean and, and, and beautiful. Um, so I look forward to sharing that with them. Um, one question that, that we lost some amount of, of sleep over uh, that I might pass on to the panel and to the room, um, you know, our view is that the uh, procedural circumstances of the sanctions contributed to uh, a certain extent the greater harms um, that we see represented on the con side this um, rushed process um, producing an overly broad uh, uh, set of sanctions documents um, with a uh, lack of clarity for ISPs on implementation, no sunset provision, all of these things that the panelists discussed. Um, and so I wonder the thoughts of, of the panelists in the room as to, um, I suppose, under what procedural circumstances such sanctions could uh, be appropriate and, and less harmful when we're speaking about the human rights concerns. Um, you know, would following proper consultation with civil society and other stakeholders have mitigated these harms or, or proper procedure within the EU and other structures? Very curious for your thoughts. Hey, oh, we'll take one last uh, person from uh, uh, person from the room. Well, not last, but before. Sorry, yeah. And then we can swerve back to the panelists and then go back to the room again. Um, thank you. Um, again, a fabulous map, really helpful, um, really comprehensive. I've thought of one possible argument in favour that is not represented, um, and I'd like to put it to the panellists for their thoughts. Um, and because it's very controversial, uh, my name is Malcolm, I have no surname, and I have no affiliation with any organisation. I'm just a concerned citizen that walked in off the street. <laughs> When we talk about policy at the IGF, normally, even though we have different conceptions of the good and we have um, different views on how to get there, we're all trying to work together and collaborate towards improving the world. This isn't one of those cases. This is geopolitical conflict. The argument here is, is really that this damages Russia, so we're going to do it because we want to damage Russia because they're invading the Ukraine and we want to pressure them to get out. Oh, we here being the, the policy makers that are doing this, not me. I think that's really the argument. Uh, now, the EU does not wish to publicly acknowledge that it's in a sort of low-level or economic war with, the, uh, with Russia, um, because that's an escalation in itself to acknowledge that. And so it comes up with this stuff about disinformation and so forth. And those arguments are as weak as they always are whenever this type of mechanism is used to block access to content on the internet. But this is not the same kind of circumstance because we're not aiming at making the world a better place here. We're aiming at harming the other guy in the hope of making him back off. And that's the justification. Or to put it slightly differently and maybe slightly more attractively, it's better to do this than advance the British and American Army of the Rhine into Crimea. And that's the justification for it. And if we, so I'd like to hear the panelists' view on that as an argument. And I'd also like to hear their reaction to the implications of that for whatever precedent value this might have. Because that would take this out of, any, uh, out of the scope of any assessment of being a precedent for other kinds of disinformation and so forth. It would be relevant for geopolitical conflict 
but not as a means to address other matters of public concern or public policy issues. Thank you very much. It's a very interesting point. Um, I thought that I wouldn't say too much myself this session, but I will provide one insight. And this is my personal insight. When, I, when, this, when this regulation was made, I think it's very interesting that we're all discussing this from an um, Internet Governance perspective, which isn't strange being at the Internet Governance Forum. However, the blocking of RT and Sputnik started out as a blockage of the television stations that, due to the European single market, were placed under a license of Sweden, but were uh, but were, were but were, were sending out, were channeling through to Estonia, Lithuania, uh, countries with a big Russian population um, that were watching these channels a lot, and so we had the the at least the Dutch perspective is that we had um, two television channels that are were well were basically owned by a, a, a nation state actor that were promoting disinformation and propaganda regarding this war being aimed at the European well members of the European Union and people living in the European Union um, so they started I think that the the, the, the uh, these for the Netherlands it, it started out as the, the, the television blockage and then of course the question is well if you're going to block the channels they can still look at it online so you also have to you there will there's a need to block it online so I don't think I think it's a very interesting extra argument, and I do urge all the panelists to also take a look at it as a way of, of, of possibly harming Russia. But I do think that the, the first intention was to protect European citizens being specifically targeted for Russian state disinformation. Um, and I also doubt how much Russia made with, I don't know how much they made with advertisements on those two channels. I don't guess it will be that much. I don't know what the economic effect were of this chat of those that map that would this band that would be interesting maybe to look take a look at um we now had uh, six very interesting comments um and i wrote them down all down i hope that that you also did so, so i'm not going to um say uh, ask specific panelists to 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 reply to specific points made but I do want to to hear your reflection on this, and let us start with Bastian. Maybe you could start with with a uh, with some reflections on the on the on the on the on the comments made. Yeah, no, thank you. No, great comments. Uh, very interesting. I took a couple of notes. Um, yeah, and with regard to the the disinformation aspect that the the gentleman from UNESCO uh, uh, mentioned, I think that was a very interesting take, and I I I I, I, I do agree. Whether that then would mean, at least from my perspective, that others who are also involved in spreading disinformation would be need to be treated the same way uh, in terms of being sanctioned, I would, I, that's not what you said, but I think I would disagree there. That would more, for me, be a reason not to impose these type of sanctions, right? I don't think, uh, from a, from a like, principal perspective, I don't think we want to fight disinformation by using censorship measures, which I think this basically is. Not everyone will agree with that. I, I'm sure that the European Union will not agree with that. But, um, but I found that an interesting, um, interesting take. Uh, the gentleman, I forgot his name, sitting behind you next, with regard to circumvention. Oh, and there was a lady. Sorry, technic the technical means, right? Like, um, I'm. I think that's a very, very interesting one. Uh, I, I briefly refer to the fact, you know, that the feedback I get from at least a number of Dutch ISPs. Um, that they are using also as an argument that is very, very trivial to uh, to circumvent, circumvent this. Um, I don't know what the solution will be there. Yeah, that's for me just more of an argument, right? Like, uh, what is it going to be effective, this this type of measure? And maybe, uh, yeah, quick reflection on what Malcolm uh, uh, mentioned. I think that's a very interesting one as well. My take on, you know, what I read, what the European Union came up with, and what I heard from others is I think I would be inclined to agree with Guus from Foreign Affairs that this is, this, from my perspective, there was not the intention to punish Russia as such. It was more from uh, the angle of um, protecting our the public order and security of our uh, European citizens. But as I referred to earlier, I don't think that the arguments are very uh, uh, substantial there. So that might indicate uh, that this could lead, could be a precedent that, you know, if it's so easy to come with these type of orders, uh, looking at the arguments they use, uh, that might be 
could be used in other areas as well. So that I, that could be in concern, I think. I don't know if that help, that's useful or not. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, w I would like to reflect on the gentleman with the beard. As my mother told me, she always said, don't do to others what uh, others do to you. And if we stand for an open, free, strong internet, we should stick to our principles in this regard, I think. Uh, although Russia and maybe China take different measurements uh, on uh, in, in infecting the open internet as we know it. And I couldn't agree more with this gentleman here because well, we have a lot of wars in the world, and why do why should politicians decide what is this information? They will be very busy if this will be a task of I don't know the European uh, Parliament to to uh, start sanctions on every war and uh, pick a side there. I I I I totally disagree with that. So that's my reflection. Thank you, uh, Mike. Um, let's also move in line. Um, Niti, I hope you were able to follow the discussion here. Um, and I was wondering if you could also reflect on, 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 the, on the comments made. And maybe yeah. also, I uh, thought the question of Kim was very interesting regarding w it, it, could it be that there, if, what procedures would justify such a ban? Maybe both for, both for you and, and Erica to also answer that question, because that hasn't been answered yet. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I think one of the things that I've heard in many many different ways is that the map is probably also lacking a human rights analysis. Like, you know, has it has it considered human rights, international human rights laws, international human rights treaties? You know, it, that is one um, big element that you know I felt was missing when uh, when I was looking at the map. Um, you know the the. What, a gentleman at the very start mentioned that you know uh, Russia chose to disconnect itself in 2012, and therefore you know what we're doing by asking, at least at least putting in a request to disconnect Russia is is not out of our right. Um, you know we can we can go on all day about this argument whether whether it, we're, we're within our right to ask an entire country to be disconnected. Um, and, and also we can keep arguing that, you know, they are already fundamentally disconnected. They don't quite use the same similar internet that the rest of the world does. Um, but, but, you know, we do believe in, in the absolute value of the internet being, being used by the end user, right? So, so regardless of nationality, creed, race, caste, color, etc. Um, the internet's a place of opportunity. And if there is even one person in Russia who believes that the internet is that place of opportunity that they'd like to use, uh, we, we'd absolutely want to, and we'd like to ensure that the internet remains open and uh, connected and secure, and most importantly, trustworthy uh, for them to be able to use. So yeah, I, I, I think it's an argument that we can go back and forth on whether it's in our right to ask an entire country to be disconnected from the internet. Uh, but as internet society, we'd, we'd not want to see that at all. Um, on, on the question of misinformation, there were a couple of questions um, asked on misinformation. I feel like, I feel like um, there, are, there are very many proposals from countries to tackle this exact same same question, right? Misinformation. There's there's so much harmful content. There's so much you know child sexual abuse material on the internet. There's so much misinformation. There's so much propaganda, and therefore we must sort of you know rein in all of these conversations happening online. But but um, as you as you very rightly said, um, uh, chair, that you know uh, governments would be extremely busy if they were to sit down and you know decide what people must consume and what people must not, or or you know how they would judge certain content to be true, certain content content to be truthful, and how they would not. Because you know, if if I am to philosophize this a bit more, we do live in a post truth society. So you know, uh, there is no one truth anymore, and therefore uh, we have all of these different questions of what the truth really is or what information is or what misinformation is. Uh, but then having said that, you know, these proposals that we're seeing increasingly point towards the same thing that, that you know, we have a problem with content moderation. Now, now at the Internet Society, we do believe that content moderation is essential. 
you know, spaces need to be safe, but at the same time, is it worth then meddling with the with the core of the internet or the infrastructure of the internet? Perhaps not. I mean, uh, that's that's my view in a nutshell. I'm just going to pass it over to Erica in the interest of time. Thank you very much, Niti. Um, my reflection here is that it's really important to link in all of these arguments with the, with the wider strategies that the EU is making use of. And I, I would like to split this down into a few sections. So the first is really working out what the impact of these sanctions are intended to be. And when we're looking at sanctions across the board, we kind of often split it down according to different types of purposes. Um, it could be just symbolic in value. It could be that um, the, the, the mere fact that these sanctions have been put in place is to signal discontent at uh, the disinformation that's contained in Russia today and Sputnik. Um, and symbolic uh, objectives is a very common uh, purpose of sanctions. Um, whether they're intended to coerce some kind of change in behavior or constrain access to vital resources or tools or platforms. And I think that this latter one is quite an important one here. Um, a, a key objective is to uh, constrain access to uh, disinformation among European audiences. Um, and and I think that the, this needs to be communicated. What are the objectives of the particular sanctions? What are they intended to achieve? And that will help answer the question as to whether it's just going to um, lead to a displacement of disinformation sources elsewhere, or if they're really intended to kind of shut them down. And I think that's a that's a really big question um, that will help uh, provide more clarity on that level. Um, we also don't yet have an effective tool to measure impacts and effectiveness of sanctions in the EU or in most places, in fact. Um, the EU is now working towards um, developing tools to assess the effectiveness of sanctions. The US is starting to do the same. We have various mechanisms in place to allow us to um, assess impacts and effectiveness of UN sanctions already. So I think there's a lot to be learned from elsewhere here. And I think it's really important that there is a reflection as to the utility of the measures that are in place. Then I think turning to the question of lifting, that how long should they be in place and at what point should they be lifted is another important one, because the risk is that what we see uh, elsewhere is uh, protracted sanctions regimes that stay in place for a long time and don't always achieve their original uh, purposes. Um, clear guidance for private sector and for others is really vital, as, as we've already established. And then a wider strategy on disinformation. How is the EU tackling disinformation? How can it be linked into other tools that the EU is already making use of, um, whether it's the cyber toolbox, whether it's um, the EU versus disinfo website um, and other other initiatives? And I think that's really, really vital here because this is going to be a, an issue that will come up in, in a variety of other contexts, not just in relation to Russia. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Niti and Erica, for your reflections. Um, we start a little bit late, so I want to give the room, if they want, the opportunity to... Can I give the room the opportunity to react, if they want? Yeah? Okay. So I don't know if there are, if there are any reflections. I just wanted to mention that... Um, I mean, the, the whole map was created under Chatham House rule. Um, we heard a lot of discussion, a lot of arguments today on the con side, but of course the pro side didn't feel itself so there were a lot of people, of course, also there um, that that were that were in favor. And and and, and uh, regarding the human rights approach, I think that that for 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 what this would, if you take a look at and and there are some people here in the room that maybe be able to more, maybe be more articulate about it. But I think that within the freedom of expression space, there is a there is a discussion happening whether and how much, uh, that you also have to write unreliable. And secure, uh, like correct information. That is also a part of 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 of, of what's intended, or at least that's uh, that's a way of how you can read Article 19. Um, and then, of course, Art Article 19.2 states out that there that the state has certain uh, reasons when it comes to national security to to Im to infringe the, the the freedom of expression. So, it's, it's I thought it was quite interesting that also people that are very much on the freedom of expression side of things are also sometimes very active and very articulate on, on, on ways and the, and the reason why we should try to um, counter uh, disinformation because it, it is a threat both to the public and also to, to journalists and media workers, etc. That being said, are there any people here in the room that want to react on this? Yeah. 
Great. Thank you very much for a really interesting discussion so far. Um, my name is Alex Bradbrook. I work in the UK government in the Department for Digital uh, in the UK. Uh, and I was actually uh, somewhat involved in the UK's own uh, sanctions against uh, RT and Sputnik and the wider uh, approach to the Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine earlier this year. Uh, I'm going to keep my remarks fairly brief because as, uh, it's, uh, I'm sure others will have uh, interesting points too. But I think I just wanted to draw everyone's minds back to the situation that we were in back in uh, March and April. Um, certainly in the UK, and I think it's probably fair to say in the EU as well, uh, we saw a very real threat uh, in place happening very quickly uh, to UK audiences posed by Russian information operations, of which uh, RT and Sputnik uh, were part of it. There's a real threat to the UK's social cohesion, to Russia's attempts to influence our populations as well. We needed to act fast. Uh, so obviously the reaction wasn't going to be perfect, but we needed to do something quickly for, for our own national security. Um, I think in terms of some of the other comments which have been made and some of the arguments on the map as well, which I thought also thought was a brilliant piece of work, um, I would just say just because something isn't perfect doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it, right? So, like, okay, yes, some of the some of, some of the sanctions can be evaded by VPNs and other technologies, but it's still reducing the reach. So, just because it's not perfect doesn't mean that we sh we shouldn't still try and do it. Um, also, uh, one of the arguments that is sometimes made on these things is kind of the slippery slope argument uh, that, you know, oh, is this going to lead to more censorship and more um, uh, and more crackdowns against um, stations or channels which uh, don't fit, uh, you know, with the norms uh, that and the democratic, democratic values that we have in the UK. Uh, again, I'd kind of uh, reject that as well because we have very strong oversight. We have very strong interest and in, uh, from parliamentarians and, uh, and interested groups. So uh, I think, you know, given that we have such a strong, thriving democratic society in the UK and, you know, I'll keep in the UK, in the EU as well, uh, I, I don't think that's a very real risk. Um, I would also, however, I would also really uh, strongly agree with the, the last speaker uh, saying that there's a real need um, to have really comprehensive disinformation strategies and to really have disinformation at the heart of when we are legislating uh, on online safety. So it's been a big part of our online safety bill which is going through the UK Parliament at the moment. I know disinformation has been a really um, key debate in the EU DSA as well. Um, and I think we need to continually think about how we are uh, addressing disinformation in the round both state-sponsored disinformation and also disinformation against uh, kind of health threats and other, other things as well, like COVID as well. So um, just a few um, thoughts there. Uh, I hope that was very interesting. Pass to someone else now. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, one, la oh, Stephen? Oh, perfect. There's a question from the chat. Thank you. I shall read it. Uh, so the question is from Amir from the Iranian academic com community. And um, their question is, what is the relation between the unilateral coercive measure in digital world and human rights in digital age, especially internet related unilateral sanctions in domains like access, digital resources, technology, DNS, and capacity building that are being applied by some states against other nations that could be a great barrier towards national development goals and constitute violation of human rights obligations? And lastly, what would be a contribution of the Global Digital Compact to address these critical issues and implementation of these solutions? I will look at the panelists. Um, <laughs> maybe we should first uh, look online. Uh, Neti or Eka, do you, would, would you, do you have a, um, an, a, a, a reply to, to, to the question of Amir? Niti, shall I go very quickly and I'll hand to you? Okay, I, I think um, those, that's a really excellent point. Thank you for raising it. Um, and I think that this is really a challenge of uh, all sanctions regimes today, that the unintended consequences need to be very carefully considered. And the more that that can be done at the point of sanctions design, so before the sanctions are even put into place, the better. Um, there are, of course, constraints in that sanctions sometimes need to be adopted very quickly, as we've heard in this particular context. But with the bolstering of expertise and capacity within governments and within the EU itself, I think it would be vital to include um, experts on um, human rights in association with internet access. Um, 
also alongside wider questions of human rights and humanitarian impacts and so on. And I think this is increasingly being done, this variety of fora now that um, exist within the EU and elsewhere that help governments draw on expertise and thinking from various stakeholder groups. And I think it's, uh, it's particularly important in this particular um, example. Yeah, I think I think I don't have a lot to add to what Erica's already said, but um, I think I think I will go back to just saying that you know there's been multi years global campaigns, you know, to to constantly keep it on. And while I don't I don't think we recognize the the access to you know the internet as a, as a as a human right yet, but I know that all three generations of human rights are absolutely dependent on access to the internet. Um, and you know there are hundreds of human rights organizations that have that have recognized that you know internet shutdowns very much like sanctions are an attack on fundamental rights and freedoms and uh, you know we don't just stand to sort of in an abstract way violate human rights you know that there, there are very many very tangible things like the economy healthcare learning you know trade that that um stand to be stand to be dented so um yeah that's that's my two cents on that Thank you very much, Niti. Um, Bastian, Mieke? Yeah, thanks. Um, and I totally agree with the, the points that Erica just uh, made. I remember, you know, when we uh, were working on the argument map, uh, I, I, <laughs> I think, in all fairness, I'm inclined to go to the con side, eh, as, as maybe my introduction also indica indicated. But during the exercise, we were also meant, you know, to take the other uh, uh, side, and in my case, and also come up with arguments why this is a, a good thing. And I, I refer to as an example then that it is a good thing that in the orders itself and um, the accompanying information that the European Union actually refers to the fact that it is consistent with uh, human rights and uh, the European Convention on Human Rights, et cetera, et cetera. So from that aspect, then taking that into consideration is, is, a, is, a, is a good thing. But I, I totally agree, you know, that wh what I hear about how the process went and, and the haste, I don't really understand why. Uh, and that uh, it was basically decided by the member states without the parliament being involved and certainly not with other stakeholders being involved. Um, yeah, I think that's very unfortunate. And from that perspective, I think, you know, the points that Eric just made are very relevant and uh, good points. Yeah. Uh, okay, one last remark from my point of view. Um, I think we're in a critical uh, point in the development of the internet and the possible fragmentation of the internet. And I, w well, we don't see the solutions yet, but I think this discussion helps uh, maturing the internet as di at this point. So I, I'm really engaged in this disc discussion and looking forward to the solutions. Thank you, Mieke. Um, I'll have a look at our rapporteur. I'm not sure if you want to give a wrap up or will you do that later? Okay, she will do that later. Then I want to thank everyone for your attention. I want to thank the panelists for their excellent points. I think we have learned some excellent extra points that we can make on, on these uh, on the argument map. I think that the, the call for, for to have it better articulated, have more time to to discuss this ban in a more multi-stakeholder fashion would have would have helped with both the legitimacy and also the implementation of the of the of the of the of the blockade. So I think that that, that these are very key points that that we can take home. Um, I want to think to thank uh, Marjolein Bolthuis from ECP to for both taking the, the initiative for this excellent map, but also for hosting this session. And I want to thank all the panelists for the excellent points. Thank you very much.